Committee on November 5th, 2018. Got quite a few resolutions and some bills on second reading. Um, unless I have any personal comments from the committee, we'll get started. Resolution RS 2018 1395 sponsors Glover, a resolution appropriating the amount of $360 thousand dollars from the general fund reserve fund for the purchase of equipment for the national fire department got a motion Move. second any discussion councilman glover sorry steve I'm new with this, folks. Y'all have to hold on. I think you're there now. Thank you, Chair. No so, uh, so what I would like to do is open my statement with asking the finance department. Uh, we had a bill. Uh, I don't know. Um, a couple of meetings ago, where it was $360,000 that was uh, to be utilized for the fire department. And I retracted this bill and, and deferred it indefinitely. And the reason I did is because it was my understanding that the hoods that this bill specifically deals with would be in that particular bill somehow. Uh, so I'm gonna ask uh, a kind of a multifaceted question. Was there anything with regards to the hoods? I mean, did it even get close to what the fire department may need for their equipment needs on the hoods specifically? Councilman, what we did is um, we sent that recommendation over to the uh, fire chief, Chief Swan, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and asked him to prioritize how the 360 would be allocated. So that decision was made by the fire chief in terms of how to allocate the 360. Okay, so director, I'm gonna ask you this question, point blank. I wouldn't put the mic down quite yet. Have we actually taken care of our first responders? Have we done what we should be doing to take care of them as far as their equipment? Have we taken care of them with regards to the cost of living adjustments? Have we done what we should be doing on this floor for the people who are out there every day. And I know you guys like to act like, well, here he goes again. But this is pretty simple stuff, in my opinion. And so have we taken care of our employees the way we should have, and specifically for the people who respond on the fires, the equipment, as I understand it, is not really that useful now so tell me when, when, see, I always get confused when you say we ask them to, to put a priority on it. They're going to tell you what you tell them to tell us. And, and I realize that sounds tacky, but that's exactly, in my opinion, the way it happens. So that being said, if we could erase all the stuff and actually take this stuff down to the bottom line, they didn't get the cost of living adjustment. The last appropriation was 360. Isn't that amazing how the numbers actually line up? And now I'm asking us to give them the equipment because we didn't give them the cost of living adjustment that so many other people in this city got. So realistically, when we look and we ask the question on the priorities, how comfortable are they on giving you that? And if, if we're allowed to remove that barrier, would they tell us that yes, it is absolutely needed? Okay, I think that that is a multifaceted It is question, multifaceted, and, yes. And I'm going to try to answer each piece of it. Uh, in any given year, the 4% availability, this, in this, this current budget year, the current 4% availability is probably a little bit over $30 million. Uh, just like any other um, 
uh, budget process or in terms of availability, we probably have 10 times that number of funding requests. And we will go through and we will assess um, all of the individual needs that everyone submits um, in terms of their 4% availability. And then the finance department does not determine the priorities for the fire department in terms of how those 4% dollars are spent. It simply just does not set those priorities. That neither does it set the priorities, for example, for general services or parks or any other department. For example, parks, if we provide money to the parks department for deferred maintenance, the director needs to be consulted and advised, uh, and she needs to tell us what's most important and how those dollars ought to be spent. The thing that the finance department knows is that we have a limited amount of resources. And um, the finance department and the finance director in particular, myself, I can't micromanage a department head and tell them what they ought to spend their money on. And I need to defer to that department head's uh, judgment in terms of what they need and how those uh, dollars are allocated. And in this case, for this allocation that was presented to the finance department, that is exactly what happened. That amount was provided to the fire chief and he decided what he wanted to use that funding for. And uh, I think he may be back there and I hope he can validate my remarks. In terms of uh, the cost of living, uh, increase, I think you ask about that. I would say our public safety departments um, um, were addressed fairly in comparison to all other Metro employees. There are um, uh, public servants throughout this entire government that uh, need to, uh, to be uh, respected and accommodated for in terms of pay plan adjustments. And what was recommended was a pay plan that would um, be fair to all Metro employees. And, that's, and, a, and it's a fair representation uh, across the board for all employees, those recommendations. So, so Chair. So did, did I answer all your questions? Well, yeah, I mean, you, okay. you, you, you gave comments on each of them, yes. Answered it, no. I think uh, I answered it, your from, questions. From, that's correct. So, as we go through the rest of this, I'm trying to figure out um, why every time we bring something to the floor for the 4% funds, why we always get trumped here, and it always has to come from the administration. What exactly do we do here? Other than you guys ask us to vote, and then after we vote, you say, this is what you did. We're, we're doing what we're supposed to do. So, yeah, I'll throw it to the chief real quick, and then I've got a couple comments, Chair. So, Chief, is this not needed? That's a real simple question. Yes or no? Is it needed or not for the people in your department? Well, the Chief Swan, National Fire Department, that's not even, a, I don't know how to answer that question that way, uh, Councilman Glover. What I will say is this. We put in our request, just like all other departments, our 4% request. Uh, we have um, met with finance, and matter of fact, we have another meeting with finance to actually be able to uh, explain our needs within the department. Our requests have been put in, and just like the rest of the departments, we will go through that process correctly, which I think is the, the right order. And I will say that no one makes a decision for my department but myself and my team. It's not the finance from the mayor's office or whoever. We have priorities that we have to meet, and with the $360,000, that's exactly what we did. Uh, as I stated earlier, we have a collage of different requests, and finance is very much aware of that. And when we sat down with them, we present our case, and we um, hope that we can present it in a manner that they understand what our needs are, and we will be just like everyone else as far as receiving the funds. Uh, we just want to do things in order. But the decisions for the fire department is made by Chief Will Swan, and that's me, no one else. I have a team that helps me within the department, of course, but I make those decisions. Okay, so once again, I'm going to ask you a quick question. And I know where the vote's going right now, okay? So I'm going to once again ask you a simple question. 
Do the people who are out here responding to these fires, do they need this equipment or not? Yes or no? We have the equipment that we need, Councilman Glover, to perform the tasks at hand. And what you're referring to about um, some hoods, these hoods are brought about, this is a whole new thing that we are trying to obtain within the department because they're supposed to be the new and, and, and great, greater things that we have as we move and progress. But as far as NFPA, we have the equipment that we need in order to perform our task. I can't answer it no other way because if I say no, then I'm saying that we don't have the equipment and we're not able to do our job. And that's not true. We have what we need to perform our task. So that's my answer. I can't answer it no other way. Okay, thank you, Chief. Well, so Chair, this went exactly as I anticipated because this is what we always do here on the floor. We've got multi-millions of dollars in the 4% fund. We had a reserve left over last year that we didn't end up utilizing and it rolled over to this coming year. And while I appreciate what the Chief just told me, uh, we've had multiple conversations as well. And so I'll renew my uh, motion to approve this because based upon the individuals I've spoken with, it probably is a good move. I think we have failed in so many directions in this city on our priorities. This was a pretty simple request, but we apparently can't even accommodate that. And I regret, I asked for a simple yes or no. So let's just go ahead and do the vote and then we'll land where we're gonna land and I really hope the people of Nashville wake up and understand that somebody better start paying attention to what we're doing in this city and what we're asking our first responders to do. And if, if they seem to think that we're good on all the equipment and everything else, then uh, I would, I, let me rephrase that. If the management seems to think we're good on all the equipment, that's their choice. I don't think that's the, the, the thought across the board. Thank you. I renew, renew my motion to uh, approve. Councilmember Pulley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a couple of questions. Uh, let me see if I get, got this right now. Councilman Glover filed a resolution to, uh, uh, for $360,000, which he deferred based upon the fact that he had a discussion with uh, finance and finance had uh, uh, included this 360,000 in the last 4% allocation. All right, and that 4% allocation went to the fire department and the fire department and the fire chief decided on his own how to use that. Is that correct, uh, uh, Madam Finance Director? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so um, one, one other question would be, um, how, how, how do you determine uh, the amount of money that you allocate to different departments when, the, uh, when you go about issuing 4% funds uh, in these quarterly or semi-annual basis like you do? It, it depends on the need and, and um, uh, that's out there. For example, out of that amount every year, we know that we need to set aside a specific amount for vehicle replacement, for sedans, for the police department, for example. So we would look at that availability and we will set aside a portion of that available funding for fleet. We know that we have computers, for example, uh, on a revolving uh, loan fund, so we allocate a specific amount out of that 4% for computer replacement. And then there are the things that um, are priorities of this body as well as the administration uh, would be another bucket. For example, we have, um, for the past year and a half, made several um, installments toward upgrading uh, mobile data computers in the police cars. So if you will recall, you'll see multiple allocations that were made to the police department just to upgrade all of the PCs and the cars. So it's, a, it's in terms of the prioritization, it depends kind of what the, uh, what's going on. There are some things that are, um, will be kind of set aside funding for and then other things that become priority. Or and, um, another thing that we usually 
um, try to make sure that we pay attention to our facility improvements and equipment upgrades and things of that nature. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this, the, we all love our first responders and what they do. Uh, I think uh, I can speak for every single member of this body and this committee when we say that. Uh, also love our teachers and love all of our Metro employees. And uh, I wish that I could give them everything they wanted every time they asked for it and then some because they, they, they deserve what we can. We're in a difficult position of having to manage uh, what we have here. And uh, I just think it really, uh, the struggle I have for this is we could all file resolutions uh, uh, for uh, any amount of money from uh, the 4% fund at our whim to, to make decisions on who to give to, what, to whoever we want to give it to. Uh, and we've got a struggle of how to manage all that money. So I think it sets a dangerous precedent when we as individual council members uh, start filing these resolutions to manage that money ourselves. So um, as much as I love the fire department and what they do, and uh, I'd love to give them all the money in the world, uh, you know, for that reason, I, I'm not going to support this resolution, even though I uh, respect very much what uh, Councilman Glover is trying to do by it. So thank you very much. I don't have anything else to say. Councilmember Weiner. Hello. That's better. Okay. Um, you know, I, I'll do respect to Councilman Glover and, and his heartfelt rationale for doing so. I think at the end of the day, we need to respect our department heads and the difficult choices that they have to make um, in juggling the resources that we have at our disposal. And while I wish we could honor every request, much like Councilmember Pulley just so eloquently shared, there comes a point in time when we have got to listen to what our department heads are sharing because they're the ones on the ground. And as much as I would like to offer, just like Councilman Pulley, um, offer all of our departments and all of our employees every top priority allocation to their needs, I, at this point, I just don't think we're there. And um, unfortunately, we have to prioritize and we have to have a set of criteria, and I think that mm. it too sets a bad precedent. So essentially, I'm dittoing everything you just said. So for that reason, I won't be able to support this. Thank you. Seeing no one else in the queue, and if there's no one else, we'll be voting on 2018 1395. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. We get a show of hands. In favor? Opposed? No. Fails one nine. Next resolution 2018 1455, sponsors Hall and Hastings, an initial resolution determining to issue general obligation bonds of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County and an aggregate principal amount of not to exceed $25 million. You get a motion. Is there a motion? Move. Second. Got a motion in a second. Anybody wishing to speak? Council Member Cooper. Thank you, uh, Chairman. And I want to mm -hmm. just appreciate uh, the District 1 Councilman for sponsoring this. And then I had a question for finance. Um, the CIB is organized by council districts um, so that you can see what's in every council district's plate. Is there a breakout of the CSP or our actual spending for the last three to five years by council districts? We can go back that far, but I know we can get um, information on, on the last couple of years, last few years. Okay, because I wasn't remembering where I've seen that, but that, that's not a standard report that you all are, are producing. That's correct, but we, uh, we can track that information. So if you, if you guys need something, we can produce something for you. Okay, well I think it gets to the heart of the councilman's not speaking for him, but uh, making a, a separate point uh, to, to his concern. And 
I, I for one, and Mr. Chairman, would, would love it. You're making me think that this is quite possible to do. For the compilation of the CSP, the actual spending by district uh, for some period of time, um, again, going too far back is perhaps a little bit academic, but in the three to five year time range, and I think all council members would benefit by, by seeing just what is spent where in Nashville. Thank you very much, Director. Councilmember Hall. Thank you, Chair. Um, I know this is a bit of an unusual request, and there's been some conversation about you know, the concern of, of course, opening Pandora's box, like with a lot of things that haven't been done before. But um, people need to recognize or understand that this is simply a matter of creating parity and addressing issues that have gone for quite some time not being addressed. We're looking at countless amounts of projects that have been in what I call the, the infrastructure queue, so to speak. CIB is a great tool, but it is not a perfect tool because it creates a window for a time frame that if something gets approved, it can happen from this point to that point. Um, when you're in a district as large as mine that has, for all intents and purposes, been a little bit forgotten for a few decades, this is about creating parity and catching up to the rest of the city. When you have a district that has probably a little over a quarter still on septic and propane, when you have a district that has, you know, about seven internet providers out of 174 available in the state, you, you kind of start to look at, not necessarily micromanage, but you have to look at all of the things that are holding that district back from reaching its full potential. So this bill speaks to not only playing catch up and creating some level of parity, but also creating an opportunity for a district to actually get to the point where it even needs to be. We want some smart growth and development in particular areas of the district while protecting our rural outliers. But if we can't flip light switches or flush commodes, then we can't do much of anything. And so, you know, I tell the favorite story of mine about probably what started my mindset around politics is, you know, my parents arguing about sidewalks for the school I was going to in kindergarten in 1979. And now as a 45 year old adult, I've only got sidewalks on one side of that street and it took 35 years to get the first side. And so this isn't a matter of um, just throwing something against the wall to see what sticks. This is also a matter of referring, like I said, to um, previous areas and issues that have, have gone unnoticed. And this isn't just limited to my district. Um, if you look at this legislation, portions of it specifically go to District 1, but others are creating a bucket outside of the normal CIB and 4% for other areas to be able to address some similar issues in their communities. Um, this council body, if you've been here two terms, unanimously supported the findings of the Fair Housing Assessment. If you've been here one term, you've done it at least once. Um, so it's not a real manner of debate when you start talking about recap areas or racially, ethnically concentrated areas of poverty, which my district and many others are part of. When, it, when you're talking about identified census tracts and promise zone areas. So this would create also not just infrastructure projects to be addressed in my district, but create a bucket for every council district that has one of those identified areas in it to be able to go into that bucket outside of CIB or 4% and address some issues that drastically need to be addressed. Councilmember Mendez. Thanks. I wanted to ask Mr. Jamison um, uh, about the fiscal note um, and what exact, it mentions that uh, the proposed bond sale wouldn't comply with the charter and I guess I wanted to hear more about why that is. The, um, 
charter spells out that any item for funding through initial resolutions, general obligation bond funding, can only be for projects that are specifically previously listed in the capital improvements budget. And there are a few items on Exhibit A, the, the proposed project list, that are not in the CIB. And I would uh, probably suggest uh, an amendment uh, sometime before tomorrow, late file amendment, to at least delete those items that are not within the current CIB. And uh, remind me what the process is about the CIB. I re recall that's not easy to amend. Right, the CIB is a bit difficult to amend um, outside of the process. After it's adopted, it can be amended uh, by the mayor upon submission to the Planning Commission, and then it comes before the council, and they have to adopt, I believe, by a two-thirds uh, majority. So it, it is difficult to amend the CIB. All right, thanks a lot. Councilmember Scott Davis. Thank you, Chair. I know I'm not on the committee. I appreciate you giving me the courtesy of speaking to your, you and the other great community members. Lots of times we get put in difficult situations. Your constituents are demanding. And then you, when you look at areas, when you look at the recap areas and look at the, uh, the fair housing, assessment, which, yeah, I voted on it twice. Um, there's a definite need in his neighborhood. And for me to sit here and support other requests, you know, support other budgets, makes it very difficult for me not to support his request because he has a strong point here. No, for the record, I support it. Now I want to give suggestions on, now that we've gotten that out of the way, I want to give some suggestions. And mayor's office, council office, councilman hall, he's had a quick, quick suggestion. Maybe, you know, so that we can, you can make sure to get everybody you need supported. And I'm not trying to interfere with what he's doing with his district is once again, I support his move that he's making. And it possibly, because he has a couple items, Mr. Jamison, that may need to be taken off there. You said a late file amendment. And maybe because it's election day, maybe you may not have enough votes here tomorrow. At the same time, my suggestion would be um, next Tuesday, um, now this Tuesday we bring it to the caucus and we invite the mayor's office and we ask, you know, hey, large number of African Americans out here in North Nashville feel the same way. And maybe there's a way that we can reach some sort of understanding where he gets the infrastructure he needs. And I believe, and I'm not speaking for the councilman for District 1. You know, I can only speak from my experience. I believe that he wants the mayor's help and the administration's help in bringing these things to this district. And I believe that the mayor's office wants those improvements out there and in other council districts. So that's my suggestion, you know, but because of me supporting other budgets and other initiatives, I'm obligated to support his. And, but I will, but, but I'm urging everybody to get on the same page here. Thank you. Council Member Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate the uh, the creativity and out of the box thinking of the council member for District One and his amazing advocacy for his um, for his district. I um, everybody knows I tend to make charts and put data in things and all that kind of stuff. So I've I've got the beginning of the information that that was requested earlier. You can go to Nashville's Open Data Portal under Capital Projects um, and see what's been done by district and what sort by whatever years. So. I mean, interestingly, from 2014 to 2018, District 1 had twice as much money spent on, on, on um, cap public works types of capital projects than District 18 did. So it would be, I think, it would be useful to have 
really good data as opposed to what people feel, because I, I guarantee everybody in my district feels like they're not getting what they want either, and I've, I've, uh, I've fought for a lot and have uh, said thank you a lot and feel like we have the beginnings or, or a, um, if not perfect, a, a good process that allows us to try to, um, to advocate for what we need within the context of what's good for the city as a, as a whole. I think the, um, the reference to the recaps is, is a much more powerful statement than what we have now in the CIB process where we simply have one out of six categories that has a waiting for neighborhoods of needs and maybe there's real benefit to having a discussion about the budget process and how we can give greater weight um, to that designation since it's, it's something that's an official designation that may um, give better information to how we, how we ultimately de divide things up from the capital spending plan. Um, but, I, but I feel like making a decision based on people's perception that one district has gotten more than another, it, it would be perhaps more helpful to actually have the data in hand. And I think that we'll discover that at different times, different districts have gotten different, uh, different weightings and the needs have been different. Um, so I'm, I'm, I, I think we, similar to the conversation we had on the last uh, very worthy proposal to try to fund departments with, with uh, equipment that they need, that if we had all the money in the world, we, we'd be glad to give them to. I think this is a similar situation of, of if we had unlimited bond capacity, it would be great for each council member to be able to advocate for the district or all the, all the recaps. But I'm, I'm not sure that we're actually making a data-driven decision at this point, and I would I would ask that, that we at least step back and, and delve deeper into that data that is available on the, on the open data portal. And I, I guarantee we will discover that all 35 districts have not had the same amount spent on them. Um, but we may be surprised to discover that, with the exception of a certain guy to my right, most people <laughs> couldn't, couldn't pass that one up. Most, most <laughs> districts have gotten you know, a lot of what they fought for, but not everything. Um, so I'm... I'm, I'm I'm concerned that this is um, a precedent that, that may generate more problems than it solves, but there's some great ideas that have been pulled out here that we may be able to, to, to use to, to further improve our process. Council Member Henderson. Well, I think Council Lady Allen has said uh, everything that I intended to say as it relates to our, our, our CIB process. I think um, uh, this council and uh, this uh, administration have worked uh, hard to make that CIB uh, process uh, increasingly um, more objective and transparent as far as how things are weighted. And um, I was not recalling that uh, one of those factors was uh, neighborhoods of need, but I, I too would encourage us to see um, if we can be even more um, specific as it relates to the racially and ethnically concentrated areas of poverty um, as far as how we're kind of weighting those projects, um, but then also be mindful of um, one of the challenges for um, our peripheral counties being um, uh, that lack of density and so when we're looking at our infrastructure investment um, and what that you know who that will serve or how many people that will serve um, uh, sometimes that makes it kind of challenging as we look uh, countywide but um, I um, appreciate uh, uh, where this resolution is is coming from and I hope we can work uh, with Councilman Hall but uh, as it relates to uh, data and our, our, our CIB process, I think uh, we can perhaps bring some more intention to that um, as it relates to those recap areas and see if um, we can adjust uh, the weighting perhaps um, uh, to, to benefit those areas. Thank you. Council Member Pulley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not going to uh, really repeat the statements that have already been made because a lot of points that I wanted to make have already been made. I uh, appreciate the council member for advocating for his district. Uh, I will say to the issue of parity, um, you know, I'd be satisfied with a sidewalk on one side of my street rather than uh, both. Uh, I can remember campaigning in ditches trying to get from one house to the next because uh, we have serious needs as well. Uh, I, I too had uh, uh, ran some numbers at least as it relates to my district in comparison and uh, for the last four years in public works projects, 
uh, a little over $5 million was spent in District 1 and right at $2 million in my district. And we have comparable census numbers. I know his geography is a lot uh, uh, bigger than mine, which really creates more density uh, in, a, in a more compact area for greater needs than what I have. So uh, uh, it's really kind of tough for me to, uh, to see this from a parity standpoint, looking at the data as it lists now. Uh, although that's raw data that's really comparable to 25 and 1, uh, I think it makes a whole lot of sense uh, uh, if you want to drive this with data to do just like uh, the previous council members have, have articulated. Let's take a look this, at this globally from a picture uh, in comparison to all 35 districts and really look at the numbers there and see and drill down on that. Uh, do appreciate where the council member is coming from. Do appreciate uh, that he has much different issues out there than... Uh, uh, than I have and others have and uh, would like to find ways to work with him on that. I, I just can't support this as uh, that mechanism. I think it does set a precedent that's a little bit dangerous. Uh, so for that reason, I'm not going to be supporting it. Councilmember Mendez. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm going to vote against because of the CIB and can't do the issuing of the bonds because of the charter. But I really would like to encourage everybody to please, please don't compare the numbers um, from one district to the next. Um, district 1 is enormous. Um, and just the miles of roads alone ought to account for it, um, all the difference in what public works is spending. Um, just from an eyeball test, there's no way that um, somebody could claim the District 1 and several of the outlying uh, edge of the county districts have the same infrastructure. Um, you, you know, uh, Council Lady Allen mentioned District 18, where I'm, I'm a resident. Um, also, uh, I, I would venture a guess that um, District 1 could get double the spending of District 18 for a generation and would still be, be behind on infrastructure compared to where District 18 is. Um, so we, we just can't, uh, and it's, it's not just District 1, District 1, District 3, District 13, District 29 that I'm watching over right now. The infrastructure um, towards the edge of the county um, in, in most directions um, cannot, has not kept up with the accelerating um, population in those parts of the county, and, and we're going to have to spend more money there. We, we need some, uh, and we've been working on this for a couple of years in the CIB process, some more transparent way to um, uh, figure out what's fair, but it can't be that uh, uh, equal dollars um, equals fairness. It's got to be getting uh, an equal level of access to service amenities and response time for emergency services has got to be the goal. And there's going to be some districts that if we if we focused on those kind of metrics as opposed to dollars, that we'd spend much more in some of those outer edge of the county districts than we will in the interior part of the county. Um, and so that's uh, my two cents worth. Um, I am going to vote against it for the reason I mentioned, but, but please, please don't compare dollars to dollars for districts. Council Member Glover. Thank you, Chair. Well, I'm going to support it because I congratulate the Council Member for bringing these inequities to, to light, quite frankly. And one of the reasons I'm also going to support it is because, you know, unless the front table up here, the administration tells us that's what we need, then we don't need it. Well, in my district specifically, there's been nothing done except for about 35 to 53 feet of sidewalks in an area that, frankly, I don't think we needed, but that was kind of irrelevant because that's what we decided we were going to do. So I applaud the council member. I'm going to support it. I think we've got to change the conversation here on this floor. If we're going to be the legislative branch, and, and then let's be that. Let's truly walk it through, understand it, and determine how we are spending money. Because all these other things we've done throughout the district, throughout the city, my taxpayers are going to pick up the tab for it. Uh, but they really have no dividends that will be shown. So, uh, Councilman, I'm, I'm going to support you. I appreciate the fact you brought this, and I appreciate the fact that you have uh, allowed us uh, to bring it to light, and so I will be supporting it. Thank you. Councilmember Dow. 
thank you. I don't want to repeat some of the comments other people have said, but I do agree uh, with the comments that Councilman Mendez presented, that we cannot and we should not get into uh, comparing districts because the cost of a project in District 1 uh, could potentially be a lot more um, expensive than a project in 18, and you get more bang for your buck because those districts are different. So I don't really think um, looking at it based upon dollars is really a fair uh, comparison. I think going out to District 1, we know that it's been neglected. And, uh, and I've shared with uh, Councilman Hall, uh, just like uh, District 32 had been neglected, that uh, when you have a lot of work to do in a sizable district, uh, uh, prioritizing what needs to be done first is, is usually a good approach to take with it. Uh, dollars have been allocated in this budget already, and that money is up for grabs as whoever presents the case for uh, the need and, and, and put it forth. And we also have dollars sitting in public works that have not been spent um, right now. So I'm not going to support this, but I want you to know that I do support you and District 1. And I think the uh, best approach now is to identify those projects that are priority in District 1, and let's get with the administration and let's get with public works and let's get a timeline for getting some of those items done. And oftentimes I would just say that uh, priorities of the people in our district are not necessarily the priorities of the city because we look at things a little bit differently. So it would not hurt for um, anyone who is feeling like they're left out or projects are not done is to, and I shared this with uh, Councilman Hall, I took pictures and created a, a, a booklet of sorts of everything everybody in my district told me they wanted and we looked at priority whether it made sense or not and cost and that enabled us to get the biggest bang for our buck and put infrastructure projects in where we got you know the most density around it and so forth so um, I would like to see some projects done over there so you have my support on those things but I can't support us issuing a bond uh, in this nature so uh, but I do support district one and would like to see um, you know, your list of projects that need to be done and how we can support you. Councilmember Weiner, Councilmember Hall, you're on the queue, but you're, I'm gonna let you bring up the rear, okay? But. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, I'll make this quick. I had the opportunity to spend the day and drive the district with Councilman Hall and found it to be um, a beautiful area. There are some spots that I had not been to before and um, found that there's great opportunity up there. Having said that, we're hearing from Public Works and Stormwater um, about the stressors um, on our infrastructure from the growth that we've got. And so we do need to make some changes and, and help them out up there because the need is great. However, um, we have to do it within the confines of our charter and within the confines of, of our process. Um, to that end, as we start looking at how we um, manage our, our budget and how we manage our processes, um, I think it'd be important for us to look at a set of criteria. Um, obviously, in my mind's eye, it would be with uh, safety first. But I think we need to look at a set of criteria for how we move forward and designate these things in the future. And um, so, again, I cannot support it because it doesn't um, follow the charter, and um, I certainly think that there are ways that we can make this happen down the road, though. Councilmember Davis. Uh, thank you again, Chairman. Um, I have some questions for Mr. Jameson. Um, Attorney Jameson, I've heard a couple of my colleagues refer to the charter. Now, I'm trying to be clear here, and I'm not trying to throw anybody on the bus here. Okay. By by, we and maybe I had it confused. So please correct me if I'm confused here. Okay. I could have sworn that we went over this, and maybe I can rewind tapes. Maybe I asked the question wrong, and I got a different answer or something. But by him asking for this, it shouldn't violate. The, it violates the charter. Or does it? Then I have a follow-up after afterwards. Sure, it's um, it's section six point one three of the charter that spells out essentially the initial bonding process for general obligation bond issuances. 
Um, you have the resolution, you list as an attachment, in this case, Exhibit A, everything you're going to spend those bond monies on. Everything on that list has to have been on the, the current capital improvements budget. If you can't, the, the charter is clear that you cannot fund those items that are not on the capital improvements budget. And just so that I'm clear, if, you know, I'm not speaking for Councilman Hall in his district, you know, hypothetically, Councilman Hall goes back and, l and lists the projects that are on the, C on the CIB, then he can issue the fund. I mean, do that obligation bonds, is that correct? Right, it, it would not, it, you could submit a late filed amendment, request only those items that are clearly listed on the capital improvements budget and then you would no longer be in violation of that section of the charter. Okay, and one more question. So, he does all that. You know, I mean, he can either submit a late file amendment or he can defer and bring it back um, next meeting either way? Correct. All right, no, no, no problem. Thank you, sir. Sure. Council Member Hall. Thank you, Chair. Um, I greatly appreciate all the, the insight and comments by my, my colleagues. Um, I want to make sure that we make note of um, a couple of specific things, that it is a safety issue when you start to talk about the stressors on infrastructure throughout the city, being the largest district, being the fact that we can't do dollar for dollar from one district to the other because I can fit multiple districts inside District 1. Um, we're at a point to where our inability not only to provide in some safety issues, but also when you're talking about concerns over um, and this is a comparative situation. When you're looking at the trajectory of this city over the last decade, um, you have to take note that the inability to progress with the rest of the city is a major factor and does need to be addressed in the CIB process. Um, that's what brought this piece of legislation to fruition was simply looking at the um, lack of a response and waiting in the CIB, um, when you have over 500 items alone that are rollover items from Metro Water and Stormwater and a couple of hundred from Public Works, we can list item for item and go line item of what can be done. I have no problem going back, putting those other things um, in the CIB as an amendment and we can, we can absolutely do that. But I want us to make sure that we're mindful of the fact that um, Infrastructure is a cornerstone. Without infrastructure, there's no density. Without density, there's no schools. And I happen to have a district where every school is on that failing list and where the property value is far less than the rest of the city. Now, if we can't grow, if we can't have infrastructure, we can't improve those schools. We can't participate economically. Being a district that has no apartments, and everybody in the district pays property taxes, we don't pay the most dollar amount, but we have the most people paying into it. And so we're just trying to do our part as a district, grow with the rest of the city, and it doesn't hurt the city one bit if it makes a lot of money in the process. Um, so I have no problem going back, doing that late file amendment, adding those items, but we really do need to have a extended conversation about how this CIB process works and look at some of these things that are um, in play here because by far um, District 1 is the land of the forgotten. Seeing no one else in the queue, we'll be voting on 2018-1455. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Show of hands please, all in favor? All opposed? One, two, three. Fails three, eight. Resolution 2018-1459, sponsors Roten. 
a resolution accepting a grant from the State of Tennessee Department of Ho Safety and Homeland Security to the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County Drug Court Program to undertake alcohol countermeasures, highway safety projects to reduce the number of drivers driving under the influence cases in Tennessee. You got a motion? And second. Councilmember Allen. Thank you. I just uh, was wondering if somebody could say what those measures were. We have someone from the drug court approaching, it appears. Hi, my name is Janet Hobson. I am a director for the Davidson County Drug Court. And what we propose to do is basically provide treatment for individuals um, who have been uh, seen with or have a history of alcohol and drug related um, issues. So we provide intensive inpatient and outpatient residential program for those individuals, as well as um, providing uh, ongoing um, uh, drug treatment and um, testing for alcohol and drugs as well. Great, thank you. Seeing no one else in the queue, all in favor? Any opposed? You adopt the resolution. Resolution 2018-1460, sponsors Wiener and Roten. A resolution approving an amendment to the economic impact plan for the Bellevue Mall development area. Move properly second. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor? Any opposed? You adopt. Resolution 2018-1461, sponsors Roten and Freeman. A resolution approving an application for a Homeland Security Grant from the State of Tennessee, Tennessee Emergency Management Agency, to the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County. Second. Uh, seeing no one in the queue, all in favor? Any opposed? You adopt. 2018-1462, sponsors Roten and Freeman. Councilman Mendez, did you want to speak on that? I'm sorry. Resolution 2018-1462, sponsors Roten and Freeman. A resolution approving a contract between the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County and Benchmark Analytics to provide benchmark management system first sign early intervention and care case action response engine software licensing project management training and support to the metropolitan nashville police department properly seconded council mendez you want to speak yes thank you um i saw in the analysis that this is a sole source contract and so i'm hoping for an explanation of uh, uh what's unique about the source and um, and then also a reminder of the procedures that are in place for sole, sole source contracts to make sure that uh, it really is something that's sole source. Well, in re uh, response to the sole source, uh, would, you, would you state your name for the folks oh, watching sorry. at home? That's Lieutenant okay. Jim Stevens with the Strategic Development Division of the Police Department. In response to the sole source, the uh, University of Chicago was one of the groups that the police department has worked together with uh, to develop our early intervention system. This per particular system um, is just a continuation of that system that we have been working with with the University of Chicago to this point. Um, there simply isn't another type of system like this on the market right now. And since we, the police department was in some ways uh, instrumental in developing this particular system, um, th there just was no other source out there available that would, uh, that would meet these particular needs. All right, thanks. And I guess finance, you all are satisfied that this uh, meets the proper procedures for sole source? All right. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry, Councilwoman, I was asleep up here.
Council Member Henderson. Thank you, Vice Chair Roten. Uh, my question was just in, you're referring to a system and we're seeing some acronyms and lingo here, first sign early intervention, C-A-R-E, case action response engine software. Can you just speak to um, what it is you've worked with the University of Chicago on and what this system does and um, what it's doing for your department and our city, please? Well, the major benefits is the early intervention system uh, sets up a, uh, some uh, measures that we watch to try to capture officers uh, who may be in need of some type of early in intervention. What it does is it looks at, at metrics such as the use of force, uh, vehicle pursuit, complaints, uh, disciplinary action, use of sick days. And if an officer is uh, acting in a way or there's some, some uh, key measures where uh, it, it could be nothing, an officer could be just be working in a very active area where he comes into contact with a lot, uh, a lot of these types of incidents. But it gives us the opportunity to look more closely at that officer. So if there is an issue there, we find it early and we can deal with it rather than the officer be involved in some kind of, in of incident. But the other thing is when you're talking about the care and the case action response engine and stuff like that, uh, there's other elements of the police department that uh, the chief's office is currently using a system called IA Pro, where they track disciplinary actions. Uh, this is all part of disciplinary actions playing into this particular early intervention system. Uh, the problem is there was a variety of data sources uh, that tracked different things with different uh, uh, workflow processes. So we needed to bring everything under one particular roof. The other very good thing about this particular system is under the old system, uh, we would analyze all this data. Uh, there would be an, a, an analysis run, and then it would spit out um, you know, problem officers or key officers that we needed to look, look at every six months. This is a real-time uh, update, a real-time analysis. So the very minute that officer reaches that threshold, we're, we know about it. There's no lag time. Uh, Six, uh, potentially six months could go by before we received the trigger from the system. Now we would know immediately. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. That's helpful. Seeing no one else in the queue, all in favor? Any opposed? You adopt. RS 2018-1463, sponsors Roten and Freeman, a resolution accepting a grant from the State of Tennessee Department of Safety and Homeland Security to the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County, acting by and through the Metropolitan National Police Department for the continued enforcement of Tennessee's driving under the influence laws. Move. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? You adopt. RS 2018-1464, Roten and Freeman, a resolution accepting the Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant from the United States Department of Justice to the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County, acting by and through the Metropolitan National Police Department for technology upgrades, supplies for direct support to basic police in service and specialized training. Move and properly seconded. See no one in the queue, all in favor? Any opposed? You adopt. RS 2018-1465, sponsors Roten, Syracuse, and Gilmore, a resolution accepting a total, totally outstanding teen advocates for the library grant from the Nashville Public Library Foundation to the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County, acting by and through the Metropolitan Nashville Public Library to advocate for the library among their peers and the community at large to plan and implement programs for teens and to represent the library at community events, meetings, and institutions. Moved and properly seconded. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor? Any opposed? You adopt. Resolution RS 2018-1467, Roten and Gilmore, a resolution accepting a grant from the State of Tennessee Department of Health to the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County Act and by and through the Metropolitan Board of Health to provide supplemental food, nutrition, education, and breastfeeding promotion to eligible persons to promote good health. Moved and properly seconded. See no one in the queue. All in favor? Opposed? You adopt. RS 2018-1468 sponsors Roten and Gilmore, a resolution accepting a grant from the Friends of Metro Animal Care and Control to the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County, acting by and through the Metropolitan Board of Health to start a community microchip fund for animals that are adopted at the shelter. Moved, properly seconded. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor? Opposed? You adopt. 
RS 2018-1469, a resolution approving Amendment 1 to the grant for the Greater Nashville Regional Council of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville, Davidson County, acting by and through the Metropolitan Social Services Commission to provide meals that meet RDA nutritional, nutritional guidelines and transportation services to eligible seniors and handicapped residents. Moved properly seconded. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? You adopt. Resolution RS 2018 1470. Sponsors wrote in a resolution authorizing the Metropolitan Department of Law to compromise and settle the personal injury claim of Rick Sandler against the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County in the amount of $24,500 and the said amount be paid out of the self insured liability fund. Moved and properly seconded. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? You adopt. RS 2018 1471. Sponsors wrote in O'Connell and Allen. A resolution approving an application for a curbside recycling grant from the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation to the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County acting by and through the Metropolitan Public Works Department to fund the purchase of curbside recycling trucks. Moved properly seconded. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor? Opposed? You adopt. RS 2018-1472, Roden, O'Connell, and Allen. A resolution approving an application for recycling education outreach grant from the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation to the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County, acting by and through the Metropolitan Public Works Department to focus on getting the word out to hard to reach to residents through a broader public relations campaign regarding every other week recycling and to fight contamination using tools that the recycling partnership has developed. Moved properly, seconded. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor? Opposed? You adopt. RS 2018-1473, sponsors Roten, Mina Johnson, and O'Connell. A resolution approving an amendment to an agreement between the Metropolitan Governor of Nashville and Davidson County and the City of Belmede with respect to the performance of municipal functions. Moved and properly seconded. Council Member Allen. Thank you. I just was trying to figure out what the pattern was for the first two years of increases before it switches to increasing according to the consumer price index. Is, is there someone that can explain that piece to me? Is there someone from the administration that can explain that? Yes, Council Lady. This was a negotiated phase-in amount. Um, I can go into great detail um, about the multiple year-long history for how we got to this point, but the um, the bottom line is that the metropolitan government is obligated to provide services to the same extent as the rest of the GSD. Um, currently, we are not providing roadway maintenance for them. If we did provide it, it would be more than the amounts that we're paying here. So since the hall income tax is being phased out, we decided to do a phase in of the um, payments to the satellite cities. Councilmember Weiner. Thank you. Um, so I don't have a question about the bill itself, but it led me to another question. And I believe that it probably makes sense to get this information either from Public Works or from Finance, and it may actually be Sharon from Public Works. So um, essentially I understand that it's less expensive for us to pay the satellites than for us to do it ourselves. Is that correct? Yes, that is true. Okay. It's public if works it, back there. I don't know if they wanted to comment. Okay, so yes. this would be then directed to you, Director. Yes. Um, if it's cheaper for the satellites to do it, and they're smaller than we are, because of our size and our ability to offer vendors more work, why are we not getting a better rate than the smaller cities? When we did the review, the largest part of the initial cost was going to be the equipment purchase for the Public Works Department. And I'm not sure uh, if the satellite cities are actually purchasing their equipment. I think they contracted out completely, but if Metro were to assume services, we would be uh, doing the equipment purchases. It was the largest expense for uh, the city. So we don't already have that equipment that's required for the work? Uh, correct. I mean, they would have to have uh, additional equipment to, co to cover those areas. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a quick question on the, the write-up, and again, Mr. Cooper uh, addressed it. The Metropolitan Government is obligated to furnish satellite cities with governmental services 
comparable to the services provided in other parts of the GST. How are we measuring comparable? What is, what is comparable? Is that a financial term? I'm, uh, he may want to jump in, but this is my understanding right. of comparable. Um, for example, um, brush collection, I think, was one of the uh, items. The satellite cities um, have a greater frequency that they do brusher and chip, you know, brusher brush collections than the city does. But if we were to start doing that, we would provide that on the same schedule as we do the rest of the city. Councilman, and the, the specific language in the charter, uh, it shall be the obligation of the metropolitan government to furnish smaller cities with governmental services so that such cities will be furnished with governmental services to no lesser extent than other areas outside the urban services district. So we basically look at what are the services the GSD gets, and that is what we would be um, expected to provide. There is a provision that allows us to consider state shared taxes and, and other taxes that the satellite cities receive to provide those services, and that's kind of what we've done in, in this balancing test. So, but we've, we've measured it financially, so to speak, with all of these services and are finding that if the satellite cities were to enforce that clause, they could conceivably have a claim greater than the one that is made in this intergovernmental agreement. Well, we, we, this is going to complicate it further, but we actually have an agreement in place that this one is mending, uh, yes, mending. That right. was from 2013. 2014, 2013. And the 2013 agreement says that the satellite cities are responsible for their road maintenance. They, they agreed to that in 2013. Now, that was before the phase out of the hall income tax, which is what led to some state legislation being filed by the small cities that would have um, uh, been a much larger hit to Metro financially. And so part of this settlement is the satellite cities agree that they will not pursue any state legislation to our detriment and will actively fight any such legislation if it's filed. Even though under the charter they, they could conceivably have a greater financial claim than, again, this stream of yes, payments. Yes, but for the existing agreement that we are already have with them okay. from 2013. Um, okay, okay, but you haven't done that math necessarily. We have done the math with Public Works and run several different scenarios in terms of estimating what we believe those values to be. Okay, so, so but from Nashville's standpoint, the waiving of the comparability in exchange for this agreement is a sound financial deal. Yes, it's it's less than what any of those scenarios present. Than any of those scenarios. Okay, thank you very much. Seeing no one else in the queue. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? You adopt. Harris. 2018-1474 sponsors Henderson, Roten, O'Connell, a resolution approving an amendment to an agreement between the Metropolitan Governor of Nashville, Davidson County, and the City of Forest Hills with respect to the performance of municipal functions. Moved and properly seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? You adopt. RS 2018-1475 sponsors Henderson, Pooley, and others, a resolution approving an amendment to an agreement between the Metropolitan Governor of Nashville, and Davidson County, and the City of Oak Hill with respect to the performance of municipal functions. Moved and properly seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? You adopt. That takes us to bills on second reading. Bill 2018-1334 sponsors Henderson and Freeman, an ordinance amending Title V of the Metropolitan Code to impose the full privilege tax allowed under state law upon the sale of tickets to events at the new Major League Soccer Stadium to eliminate general fund subsidy for debt service and to better support future maintenance. Moved and properly seconded. And we're lighting up like a Christmas tree. Council Member Henderson. <laughs> Thank you, Vice Chair Roten. Um, I apologize prior to the uh, move and approval. Um, it was my hope to move to defer one meeting, please. That's a proper motion. We have any opposed? Seeing no one opposed, it is deferred for one. Oh, is there any discussion on the deferral? Sorry. 
Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? We defer one meeting. BL 2018-1372, sponsors O'Connell, Vercher, and Bedney. An ordinance authorizing the Metropolitan Governor of Nashville and Davidson County to purchase certain property from the state of Tennessee located at 88 Hermitage Avenue. Matt Parfell, number blah, 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 blah. In a motion, moved properly, seconded. I see uh, Council Member Freddie O'Connell has made his way into the chamber and would like to speak on this. Council Member O'Connell, it is good to see you, Mr. Council. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It is a great pleasure and privilege to be here this afternoon. I really, uh, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate the recognition for a member who is not on this committee. It's, it's an honor. Um, I have been encouraged by the administration to defer this for two meetings. We've got, this is a, you know, I think for anybody who's been following the story of the, the proposed location for Nashville School of the Arts, um, dating back into our, our budget conversation and some complicated land transactions. This is, uh, this is state owned, uh, an option to acquire actually recently expired. We are waiting on some further uh, information from the state before it makes sense to proceed with this. And so I would encourage the committee to defer for two meetings. It has been moved and properly seconded for a deferral for two meetings. Seeing no opposition, all in favor? So moved. BL 2018-1373 sponsors Murphy, Vercher, and Bedney, an ordinance declaring surplus and approving the disposition of parcel of real property known as 3800 Charlotte Avenue. Moved and properly seconded. Councilmember Mendez. I'm not sure who the right person is for this. I see Council Lady Murphy um, is in here. Um, I know this property came up during the budget process, and I just, I guess I was curious about an update about uh, what the plan is, and I'm, I'm assuming uh, Council Lady Murphy is in favor of this, um, and uh, what's going to happen with the property. Not sure who the right person is for that. Once approved by this uh, body, the uh, property will be sold on EBID for sake of transparency. And we will go through various motions uh, to market the property, to make sure the public is aware of it. Um, we are not going to have any restrictions per se on the property except those that were brought up earlier. And there's a companion zoning bill for it as well. Okay, and um, so as far as the use, there, it's whatever the buyer is going to take it, and then if they want a zoning change, they'll ask for a zoning change. Well, the zoning change is recently, was, yeah, it's being put in place now. I see. Okay. So it's a mixed use zoning. Uh, will allow the buyer to, you know, uh, more flexibility in what he's going to build. And, and Metro has been through its internal process of surplusing? Uh, yes, it, uh, it's been a mandatory referral. Um, and uh, we have appraisals in place on the property. Uh, it's been, we've had environmental studies done and it's, it's ready to go. All right, thanks a lot. Okay. Councilmember O'Connell, you cannot leave. I'll let you speak. You must stay until the end of the meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs> Councilmember. Dow. Thank you. I just have a quick question to ask. Why, um, when, we, when we, do we have any other uses for this public property um, besides putting it in, um, uh, besides putting it on the market and selling it? I just recall us having a conversation a while back about like needs in the community, especially when we talk about affordable housing and so forth. Have we thought about, you know, how we surplus property and the potential to use it for uh, other uses that we have within the city? Someone from the administration want to take that? Or Mike? I'll, I'll take it. Um, in, in terms of other uses, this is uh, this and the next property that um, is before this body for consideration are um, two pieces of property that were um, uh, put in the budget for consideration uh, as a revenue source for this year. 
So we're selling it off just to get money. Well, um, the, the question I ask, are we going to um, compensate the million dollars we spent moving the salt bin over to this location and then subsequently moving it back in the general fund so that it can be utilized by other districts? Uh, the salt bin uh, was not a million. I think it was probably it's about... It's 500000 it and then about, another five hundred because I voted on it. Uh, I think there was only one. There, there were several deferrals along the way, but I think... Public Works is back there, but they can confirm the uh, final amount. But I do think it was a, a single appropriation for half a million. Mm -hmm. So but, are we going to um, pay that back since we're when we sell it? So that it's it not it's not that we're going to pay it back. That was planned in the overall scheme for the uh, sale of the property because we had to relocate the uh, salt bin. As, and as uh, Mr. Berry mentioned, you know, we had to do other things at that property, such as the environmental or whatever. Those are all were in preparation for preparing that parcel for uh, placing it on EBED. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, it seemed like we already have it sold and know who's going there. So I was just curious if we could, you know, we're getting something out of it. But thank you. Councilmember Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Similar question. When we sell property on EBIT, is there any way to include a requirement to include some affordable housing, for example? Is that, can, is that possible in the EBIT process? Turn on, can you turn on the administrator desk, Mr. Chair? I'm sorry. Sorry to wake you up. Okay. Thank the, you for waking uh, me up. <laughs> the only way to... Uh, I mean, when you put it on EBID, uh, you will just list the parcel and the beginning price will be the appraisal, the appraisal price, and it's a free market and people just bid on it. I think the only restrictions are the zoning in terms of um, what's available and any others and, and how it's permitted. Uh, those are the kind of the only rules when something goes on EBID and then it just goes to the highest bidder. And is that required to do that by charter, or by, is that just how we've done it? Well, when you get beyond just that, then it's no longer uh, an EBID process anymore. You're looking more at an RFP type process when you're putting those types of restrictions on a particular use of a property, and you would run an RFP process because uh, different developers may, would have to come in with different proposals on how that property would um, be used and there would have to be an evaluation process in terms of what's the best use of that facility. Gotcha. So it's a different kind of evaluation. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Have, have we, has, has someone gone through the process of, I mean, I'm not necessarily a life cycle cost analysis, but just some quick cost benefit comparison of meeting the needs of affordable housing, for example, and, and the extra expenditure it would take to go through an RFP process to, to make that outcome be part of this, since that's something that we're struggling with as a city? Uh, no, we haven't, and, and quite frankly, um, uh, part of it is we are working on a strict time frame, time frame. in order to get the um, get this property sold before the end of the fiscal year, and if we were to go through an RFP process, I'm not sure that we'd be able to um, accommodate that deadline by June 30. Okay. I mean, I, I understand the need for the budget, and I appreciate the way y'all have figured things out. I, I would just like to throw that thought out for future surplus property down the line, that we continue to make that possibly a part of it. Thank you. Councilman John Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, everybody. A couple of uh, questions, if you didn't mind. What metro facilities at, well, first, how large is the tract of property? Uh, that tractor property is 4.35 acres. And what metro facilities are currently on the 4.35 acres? Currently, you have uh, a public works component that's there. You also have a fire department component. Um, you also have the salt bin. And general services has some uh, use there as well for uh, uh, fuel. Okay. So oh, for fuel, really? So it's a well-used piece of property. Mm -hmm. What is the cost estimate of relocating all of those services that are currently on that four-plus acre piece of property? Um, an all-in cost, including soft costs, move, 
uh, we estimated it to be approximately uh, 4.2 million. Okay. But we have a breakdown that we can provide if, uh, if you'd like that. And do you, and what, does that include the land value where they're going to, or is um, that just the? Uh, yeah, I should have noted this. They're all relocating to Metro on property. Okay. So there's no land costs associated. But the, but we'll need about the same number of square feet or acreage for the relocated facilities as are being used now? Approximately. Okay. So we're swapping the same space and it'll be four plus million dollars to relocate. And then how are we building those facilities? Will that be in a future capital budget? I think it's our... Right. They're moving to existing land, or do we have to build new facilities? Um, there are some, some uh, modular trailers that will be provided. And um, on regard to Maya Drive, there is some cost, construction costs associated with that. Right, which will be in the breakout. That we'll send which will be in the breakout of the four plus million dollars right. on the relocation. So my question really is, are we t taking, assume we sell it for $9 million and you have $4 million of relocation, you're only netting $5 million on yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> the budget estimate for these two properties is um, uh, roughly $10 million. And um, between the sale of these two properties, uh, that's about approximately, after you pull out those costs, that would be the net W would be the, would be yes. the, with a net and which is the budget estimate for this so we took all that into account in determining the estimate but you're having to spend out of the capital budget maybe four million dollars to accomplish the relocation for the operating budget then to get the five million dollar benefit so you're swapping capital well, money for operating money for some of it, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and then um, this zoning under EBID, how do we promise this more favorable zoning on the EBID? Okay. That's what's approved. In other, in other words... Uh, that this has already gone through Title 17 and is approved. Well, it's... It's running parallel with this. That's on public hearing tomorrow night. Right. Um, okay, but just to recap, on this four-acre piece of property with customized zoning, we hope to net, and this is important, I guess, for the operating budget, you're only really going to be netting about $5 million, right? Because you're going to have $4 million worth of cost to relocate the facilities that are currently there. And is that, where is that in terms of the June projections? in terms of need for proceeds? Well, we have projected that we will bring in $10 million of revenue through the sale of these two properties by June. Well, you're, June of 19. But that doesn't, that's not netting out your relocation costs. No, that is the net number. So the you're net number it for is 15 the, or right, for 14 if, million? If you look at the, yeah, it's both properties. You have oh. to look at the appraisal value of both. I'm talking about both properties together. The other property being the Green, Green Hills, Hills? which is the next one. Oh, okay. Well, I was just t talking about the Charlotte right. But property. The, right. But the, um, the revenue estimate is based on both properties, the estimate of the $10 million. So five from here and five from Green Hills, which does not have a relocation cost associated with it. Okay. And then the, the, but the cost for relocating that $4 million, that, uh, that does not include the use value of the land where that's going to in that relocation cost. So if I have an acre here and I'm taking an acre over there, I'm assuming that the, acre, the land that we're going to is free. That's correct. Because it's already metro property but conceivably would have a value, as Councilman Allen was saying, for affordable housing or some other metro, or some other use. You, your math is showing that it's free, just confirming that, that that 
and we're not implying a, 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 an opportunity cost for that other land, so That's to speak, correct. in your analysis. Okay. Right. All right. Very grateful, uh, as always. I guess I don't view um, this as compelling enough financially to go through this, but I appreciate everyone's hard work uh, in, in untangling all these strands. Thank you. Councilmember Davis. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm in support. Um, the salt bin is being relocated to my district, which I already have a salt bin. And I'm all for adding another salt bin to it. I already have some services with public works over there also. It is an industrial area. And I'm in support because that means most of my streets will have the salt first, but it has great highway access, so it'll get to you guys pretty quickly. Thank you. Councilmember Mendez. Thanks. Um, back when we did the budget process, um, I think I was um, as loud as anybody about hating the idea of uh, selling off properties to make the budget meet. Um, but. The fact of the matter is we, we passed a budget that required selling off property to make uh, the budget meet. Um, and, and so um, my uh, issues go to, you know, the idea of using this for affordable housing. This is why we need um, a real live operational land bank now rather than several years from now, um, because surplus property ought to be going to that, not getting sold off to make the, the budget meet. Um, unfortunately, I think for um, uh, to try to force affordable housing through an EBID, um, we'd run into um, gray area with the recent state law saying um, what we can and cannot do on affordable housing. I think, uh, I think it would be a gray area. Um, the reality is that uh, um, this council voted to approve a budget that um, needed 10 million bucks from selling off real estate to make ends meet. And uh, um, the council member in the area is in favor of it. The council member where the services are going is in favor of it. Um, we already passed um, the budget needing it. Um, I think uh, we ought to go ahead and do it. Council member Dow. I just wanna make one um, point of notification. Just because the salt bin is uh, located in your district doesn't mean your streets are salt at first. As I shared last winter, we have a salt bin as well, and we're the last ones uh, to receive salts on our roads. So uh, maybe East Nashville is different, but I can tell you it doesn't offer any favors to us. So thank you. Seeing no one else in the queue, all in favor? Any opposed? No. Show of hands, all in favor? All opposed? Two. Bill passes 7 2. BL 2018 1378. Sponsor is Syracuse, Virtue, and Roten. Oh. My apologies, I skipped one. Oh, on the last bill, just for the, for the committee, uh, Council Member Murphy did send a letter with that, our able counsel wanted me to remind you all of that. So. Uh, 2018 1374, an ordinance declaring surplus and approving the disposition of a parcel of real property known as 2025 Richard Jones Road. Moved, properly seconded. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor? Any opposed? Show of hands. All in favor? All opposed? Passes 6-2. 1378 Syracuse, Virtue, and Roten. An ordinance approving an amendment to an agreement between the Metropolitan Government of, and Plaza 2750 LLC concerning the acquisition of real property for use as a site for a new public library in Donaldson and acquisition and construction of related infrastructure improvements. Moved and properly seconded. Councilmember Mendez. I don't, maybe the uh, sponsor or Mr. Jameson, um, just looking for a brief explanation of um, what the amendment is. I'm assuming that it um, is taking out 
parts of the deal that had to do with transit-oriented development. Uh, I guess the thing I'm looking for confirmation for uh, is, so it's eliminating all references to transit-oriented development. It's the, the deals going forward without that now? Correct. And the, and the Sorry, hold on. That is correct, as well as the tax increment uh, financing. And then there's an additional 1.250 uh, from Metro to make up the difference, so to speak. Um, and that was uh, specifically referenced in the capital fund this year. So that's an appropriate designation. Councilman Syracuse may want to add to it. So th that's adding some capital spending? Correct. Um, and so uh, I'm in favor of this. Um, I think the idea of uh, us doing direct capital spending on this rather than giving away um, property tax income for 145 acres for 30 years is a vastly preferable way to do this. I think this is a great for the Donaldson community. Happy to support it. Councilman well, Syracuse, would you please tell everyone how great Donaldson is and about the library, please? Thank you. Wow, I can't, can't do that in a short amount of time, right? Um, I really appreciate it. Yeah, as you saw in the analysis, there's not an additional uh, bonding here. This is, uh, we already passed capital spending plan. The extra 1.25 comes out of that. So I look forward to a new library in Donaldson. Thanks for your support. Seeing no one else in the queue, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? You adopt. Seeing nothing else or anything else on the agenda, unless there's something personal, we are adjourned. Oh, I got something personal. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.com.